Hi, everyone, and welcome to this new MLIR meeting. Uh, today, we're going to have uh, Vinicius uh, with a proposal about MLIR pattern matching. Vinicius, the floor is yours. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Vinicius, a master's student at UNCAMP. I'm currently researching pattern matching and rewriting. Um, throughout my master's, I developed alongside colleagues a tool called SMR. And SMR can rewrite complex patterns to high level library calls by leveraging MLIR. And today I wanted to present this work, uh, hoping this might get, be a good opportunity to get some community feedback. Uh, so before I begin, I want to give an overview of the presentation. I will start with a brief introduction to contextualize and explain the motivation and goals for our work. Then I'll give a brief overview of SMR, which is the tool that we developed. Then I'll get a little bit more in depth and how it actually works under the hood, talking about the algorithm that is beneath that. Um, and finally, to wrap up the presentation, I wanted to talk about some of the results we achieved with the SMR. Uh, so first, let's start with the introduction to explain our goals and motivations. Um, traditional rewriting usually follows a strict lowering process uh, enforced by the compilation flow. So we are used to usually lower from high level operations to lower level ones. And this lowering was mostly fine until some time. Uh, recently, we have more hardware accelerators that have appeared. So we have things like Intel AMX, uh, IBM MMA, which are ISA instructions that can higher level ISA instructions. Uh, among other things like Gemini, which is a open source uh, deep neural networks accelerator. They also leverage custom hardware. And these accelerators require a higher level instruction than most IRs offer. So we now must match more complex combinations of instructions in order to replace them with higher level operations, essentially raising the representation to a higher abstraction level. Um, some tools have already tackled this problem. So we have things like IDL, which describe patterns as constraints, constraint satisfaction problems. And while this increases generality, it also makes more difficult to write patterns. Another example is kernel fairer, which extends LLVM pattern matching to rewrite complex patterns. Um, but since LLVM IR is a bit of sort of a lower level IR, it's kind of hard to describe complex pattern with it. And we also have other things like MLT, which uses a custom uh, tensor-based language to describe patterns, which is seemingly simpler than others, but still requires some custom dialect knowledge to actually use it. So overall, each approach has its own trade-offs. Uh, ours is no exception to this. And, but a common staple between different approaches that we see is that it's usually difficult to write patterns to them. Uh, with all this context in mind, our goal was to develop our own approach for better matching and rewriting to leverage hardware accelerators. And to do so, we must be able to match complex patterns and raise them to a high level library calls uh, for these accelerators. And however, we also wish to avoid uh, the complexity of describing patterns and replacements, which is a common issue that we find in other tools. Um, and another bonus for that would be that we wanted the tool to be as embeddable as possible in existing compilation flows to lower the level, the barrier of entry even further. Um, and now that I have some context to SMR, I'm going to talk a little bit about what SMR actually is and how it's used. Um, so SMR stands for source-based matching and rewriting. It's a tool for easily rewriting code by allowing the user to specify rewrites using pure source code. And although the rewrites are specified using source code, uh, the, the, the matching and replacement process actually happens at the MLIR level. And the output of SMR is a optimized MLIR file and a rewritten MLIR file. Uh, to develop SMR, we mostly used two tools. Uh, those would be MLIR and Twig. MLIR became our choice of framework, mostly due to two reasons. Uh, its IR allows for higher levels of abstraction, which simplifies recognizing uh, complex patterns. Right? And it also enforces a, a common set of rules for different front ends, which helps us to integrate SMR with different source languages, since we are describing the rewrites using source languages. Uh, and another tool that was a, a big inspiration for SMR is Twig, which is a node compiler made by Aho. 
this, this compiler uses some clever ideas to represent patterns using string-based automata. And I won't get into much detail here because I want to talk about this when we actually get into the algorithm. So, so, let, uh, so we'll see a bit more of this later. Right. So now that you know what SMR is and its foundations, uh, how it's actually used. Here we have a simple example where we have the input we want to rewrite and a pet file. The pet file essentially describes the, the rewrites we want to perform uh, in the input file using source code. So the description here is pretty simple. We have the language that is being used to describe the pattern and the replacement. Then we have the pattern block, a divider, and the replacement block. And essentially what we do is we match this idiom against whatever is in the input code and replace by whatever we have paired with the pattern in the pet file. Uh, to use these input files with SMR, first we serialize the pet file to an object pet file. And this is essentially allows us to compile everything and view the required automata only once. Uh, and once we have the serialized path file, we can then apply the rewrites in it into some input that we want to optimize. So here we'll be applying the rewrites into this input and the resulting file will be an MLIR uh, optimized file. So overall, the, the usage is meant to be pretty simple. Um, now let's take a brief look at each one of these commands individually. So the serialization essentially takes the path file, parses that, separating uh, the patterns and replacements. And once we have everything broken down, we then compile that to MLIR using the proper front end. Once we have every pattern replacement in, M uh, in MLIR, we can then proceed to build the automata that will be used to effectively, effectively match the input against the patterns. And once all of that is ready, we then store both the, the automata and the replacements into the object path file. This object path file essentially can then be reused at will without having to uh, repeat all this process. And now that we have, uh, and okay, so just a little bit more detail to why we serialize the pet file. Uh, this is mostly to improve reusability, right? Every time, since we're using source code to describe rewrites, every time we need to compile these rewrites and basically build the automata that will represent the patterns in order, in order for us to match that with some input code. And the goal here is to avoid overhead in future reuses of this path file. And the idea is that it can serve as a library of patterns, which we can just build and compile only once, build the automata, and then reuse as wish. So if we have a bunch of gem patterns and we want to optimize gem patterns in some input code, we can then use this path file to perform set optimization. And the second command I mentioned, which is the one that actually loads the path file and performs the matching process, is uh, a bit different. We take the input file and we compile all the same. And the meanwhile, in the meantime, we also load the object path file, which will give us the automata that is used for matching. And then the matching will occur in basically two stages. The first is the CDG matching, which will account for just the control flow of the input in the pattern. And whatever passes through the first stage goes to the second stage, which will then look into the data flow of both the input and the pattern. And if the second stage uh, has a match, it essentially, we consider that a, a possible rewrite. So whatever is matched on the second stage is then, then, is then passed to the rewriting stage and replaced by whatever specification is in the path file. Uh, and in, in the end of all that is the optimized MLIR input code. Um, okay, uh, so now that I have properly introduced SMR, I'm going to start to get a bit more into the details of the algorithm that we talked about uh, in this process. So the CDG matching and the DG matching. Um, so to simplify things, I'll show the algorithm here without the serialization process. We first start parsing the path file, as I mentioned, uh, separate the patterns and replacements. We then lower everything to MLIR because as I mentioned, the matching and the replacement actually happens at the, the MLIR level. And then we move on to the first stage where we'll represent the pattern and the input as a structure that we call the control dependency graph. This, structurally, this structure essentially represents the control structure of both the input and the pattern so that we can match uh, both of them. And whatever is, uh, is matched here is then passed down to the second stage in which you use a second uh, structure that we call the data dependency graph. Uh, 
And the data dependence graph essentially models both the input and the pattern data flow so that we can also match them. And finally, if the second stage is a match, we proceed to the rewriting stage. Uh, so let's take a look uh, into this algorithm step, step by step. Here we have some input code that we want to optimize. We also have a rewrite in the pet file that is pretty simple. It's just replacing some if else statement with a, a call to some library. And the first step here is essentially to parse this pet file so that we can then compile and lower to MLIR. Right? And here, as I mentioned, it's a pretty simple process. We don't have any. Uh, we don't really have any sophisticated parsing for the pet file. It's almost that like a macro definition for us. So we have a language. Uh, the pattern and the replacement, uh, you can see the same structure here. And this is then break, broken down into the pattern code and the replacement code, which will be compiled to the subsequent stage. And uh, once we have everything broken down, we can then move on to the next stage, which is the compilation to MLIR. Uh, oh, uh, one important note uh, in the, the pad description, although we describe the pattern with functions. So here we have the pattern contained within a function. This function is not actually matched. And here I just wanted to talk about a bit the concept of wrapper functions. Um, if we had to match these functions, they, the pattern wouldn't be very useful, right? Because we would be basically restricting the pattern to be just that snippet of code inside a function. So we call these functions wrapper functions because they are just wrapping the actual pattern. So what is effectively match is whatever is in the body of the function. And why do we need these functions in the first place? Well, since we're using source code, the code needs to be valid so that it can be lowered to MLR, right? Otherwise, the front end might not be able to compile that. And certain statements are only valid within functions. So if we had not those functions, we wouldn't be able to match those kinds of statements. And a second thing that it helps us with uh, is that the function arguments can act as an interface for both matching and rewriting. Uh, in the matching case, uh, they essentially act as unknown variables that are used for the patterns. So they are almost like wildcards, right? Essentially here we're saying that we need this test variable and this value, uh, vault variable, but we don't know their values. We only know that they must be integers. And once we have this, the matching done, we then proceed to the rewrite. We also need to know how to replace this pattern with this replacement. And this list of arguments also helps us do that. And the replacement will have two input variables that can then be mapped to whatever was matched in test and vol in the pattern. So these are the two main functions of the wrapper functions. They essentially simplify the matching process and make the code valid so, valid so that it can actually compile it. Uh, all right, so once we have everything broken down, we lower to, to MLIR using the proper front end. So in this case, we have a, fear, a sorry, Fortran code, which then we use flank to lower to the fear dialect. And once we have everything MLIR, we can proceed to the first matching stage. So we know the pattern, the input control structure, uh, and we do know that if it is a match, it must match control structure. So we then represent both the input and the pattern as what we call a CDG, the control dependency graph. And then we match those two structures to see if they have a similar control structure. Uh, so the first step is to convert whatever we have in MLIR to, to the CDG, which will be this structure. And this process is relatively simple. We just essentially keep the, the operations that define the regions. So for instance, if, if operations are kept, we also keep the regions that the operation defines. So the first region is kept here and the second here. The same goes for the nested fury if operation. And we also have uh, a sequence acronym that represents sequence of operations that do not define any regions. And this gives us an idea of a control structure that can help us filter uh, which sections of the input might have a match. So once we have the control dependency graph for both the input and the pattern, we can do a sort of substring search using automatas that will tell us which sections of the input might have a match. And this is very helpful because it, it can greatly reduce the search space for the subsequent stage, which is much heavier. So when we move on to the next stage that where we actually have to model the data flow, we can only look into these candidates instead of the entire input code that can be thousands and thousands of lines. So now let's talk a little bit about the second stage. Uh, 
once we have uh, the the CDG matched, we know that that's not enough because just because they have a similar control structure does not mean they have the same computation. So the second stage uh, must match the data flow within the regions that represent the control structure. And here's where the second representation will come into place, which is the data dependency graph. The goal here is to represent the data flow of both the input and the pattern so that it can, can make a more granular match to ensure the codes are uh, equivalent. So how do we build this the DG structure? We start by looking to the use def chains, as this already gives us some data flow information. So we have input and output operands here. Um, but this in itself is not enough, right? There's still a lot of control flow information missing. For instance, the regions for the free operations are an example of this. So we need to complement this graph with some additional info. And here we have to add two things. Uh, the next step, essentially, you color the codes according to the region that they are in. This allows us to add more data flow information into the graph. And so, for instance, the fear if operation in the first region, region, it has these two operations. So they are colored the same way. And the second region, it has all the operations colored yellow and so on. And we also add what we call region edges. Uh, these essentially link operations that do not have a, a incident edge. For instance, this fear star does not have any incident edges in the use def uh, graph. So to make sure that the graph has a root, we add the region edges. And the importance of the root will come into play in the subsequent part of the match where we need to represent this an automaton, right? And the idea of the region edge is essentially to take the, the, the fear if operation, a link to whatever operation does not have any incident edges in the use def chain graph. Um, these edges are also alphabetically labeled, so they do represent the, the order of the regions as well. Right. Um, there is another important detail here. Um, the information that, that we have to encode in the data flow might vary according to the dialect that we are actually encoding, right? So since MLIR can be configured on a dialect basis, what has to be matched in the dialect might not have to be in another. And to circumvent this, we use a dialect-wise configuration in SMR so that we can specify, for instance, which attributes must be matched for each operation in each dialect. One example of this is the predicate attribute that is present on both the compare float and if uh, operations in here because these predicate attributes, they actually define the comparison being made, which is extremely relevant for the match, not match something that is making a completely different uh, comparison, right? And once we add these attributes in the dialect-wise configuration, the DDG will also include them into the codification of the graph. Uh, right, so once we build the DDG for both the input and the pattern, we actually need to match those two graphs. And to do so, we convert them both into set of strings, and the set of strings that represent the patterns are then encoded into an automaton. And the input set of strings can then be fed to this automaton, effectively matching the input, uh, the input of the DDG against the pattern DDG. And I did mention that Twig was an inspiration for the algorithm, so I'll bring it up uh, here because I actually want to talk about how Twig works and how we adapted the, the idea that Twig presents for better matching into SMR. Um, so essentially Twig has uh, patterns represents, represented as trees and these trees can then be converted into a set of strings. And these strings that represent each pattern can then be encoded into an automaton. So effectively, we transform every single tree-like tree pattern into a set of strings, and each set of strings then inserted into the automaton. When we want to match something, we basically pass uh, the input set of strings to this automaton, and if it matches all the states that are all the final states that are related to a pattern, we then know that the, the input code is a match to this pattern. So, for instance, uh, in in the, the the T1 pattern here, it has three strings, and it can be represented by the final state, the final state three, the final state nine, and the final state uh, 13. Oh, sorry, 13, no, uh, the final state 11. So if we match all these three final states, we know that we have a match with the pattern T1. Uh, 
And there are two interesting benefits of this approach. The first is that once we feed the input strings, we are effectively matching the input against all patterns simultaneously because they are all encoded into the same automaton. And the second benefit this approach also presents is the merging of common prefixes. So we can see here that multiple strings can share the same uh, prefix. And if they share the same prefix, they eventually share the same path in the automaton, compressing the, the amount of, of states we need to represent all the patterns. So how do we translate Twig's method to the DDG representation? Well, first we need to essentially convert everything to strings. And since we have a rooted graph, this is relatively simple and we also have no cycles. Uh, we essentially trace every path from the root to every possible leaf. And as we walk through these paths, each node uh, edge label will be converted into an, a character in the string. So the red path, for instance, goes to fear if, then edge B, then uh, second fear if, uh, edge one, a compare operation, edge two, and SD const. And each one of these uh, labels are essentially converted into characters in the string. The same happens for the blue path. And once we do this for every single path in the graph, we have a string set that represents the DDG of this uh, particular pattern. And once we have the, the set of strings to encode them in an automaton is also relatively simple. Uh, all we must do is essentially to convert each character in the string as a transition uh, to another state in the automaton. So here, for instance, if you go back to the, the stringification of the red path and the blue path, and we encode these strings into an automaton, we would have something like this, where I start at state zero, we then transition using the token theory of to state one and so on until we reach a final state that represents the red string. The same goes for the blue string. And here you can already see one of the benefits uh, that I mentioned of Twig's approach that is the merging of common prefixes between those strings. Once we do this for every set of string that, uh, and, and then for every pattern, right? Because each pattern becomes, is a set of strings. We have all, all the patterns encoded into a single automaton. And now we can proceed to actually use this automata to match the, the input set of strings. So for the input, we essentially do the same process. We take the DDG of the input candidate that we found in the first uh, match, the first stage of the match, which is the CDG. And then we convert that to strings as well. And once we feed this to the automaton, we eventually find if the set of strings that represent the, the, the input will match or not a set of final states that represent uh, one of the patterns in our path file. So overall, this is a, a, a bit of a dense overview of how the algorithm works. To recapitulate, the algorithm essentially first parse both uh, the input and the rewrites, compile them to MLIR. Then we filter the input with the CDG matching. They just look at regions for the match to try to, to reduce the search space for the subsequent match, which is the DDG matching, where we have to actually match the data flow, which is much heavier. And if we do happen to find a match in the DDG, we can then proceed to apply the rewrite. I won't get into much detail about the rewrite because it's, it's relatively simple. We just replace whatever was matching the input by extracting that and injecting a, a function, a call to a function that will represent whatever was in the replacement. So as we saw, the replacement is wrapped by a function, and then we can call that function uh, to actually execute the replacement code instead of the, instead of the pattern code. Uh, right. So now I, I'll talk a little, I gave a little bit of context to SMR, uh, explained what SMR is, and gave an overview of the algorithm. So now I, I actually wanted to wrap up the presentation, talking about some of the results that we achieved with this tool. Um, <clears throat> Our experiments aim to validate if SMR basically achieved our goals. So uh, is, it, is it capable of raising? Uh, can it match a complex set of instructions and replace that by API calls? Is it easy to use? So is, is writing rewrite specifications uh, simple enough? Is it scalable? Will it still work well if we have a lot of input lines or thousands of patterns? And if it is flexible, essentially since we're using source code, does SMR actually work with multiple languages? The experiments aim to answer these questions. So in the first set of experiments, we raised polybench kernels to blast calls using SMR. Uh, here we have two examples of code raising using the bad language. 
they are both polybench kernels, as I mentioned. Uh, and here we have a, a naive gem being replaced by a blast call. And the second pattern, we have a 8x kernel being replaced by two blast calls, since we do not have a, a matching blast call to replace the 8x kernel. And the idea here is to show that this is a, a far more simple approach to describe patterns, right? There are no need for custom languages or custom compilation flows. And it is a pretty intuitive source code based representation. We have the pattern we want to match and the replacement we want to take its place. And these rewrites, uh, they're functional, right? Uh, we were able to replace several polybench kernels using the simple rewrite specifications. So on the left here, we see that the rewrites achieved expect speedups from BLAS. Uh, we have here SMR plus BLAS, which are the kernels rewritten with SMR uh, by BLAS calls and eh? replacing with BLAS calls. And the comparison of the flank and both to Fortran. And to the right, we have the compilation overhead caused by SMR. So these can range from 5 to 20% usually. Uh, and basically what you see is a, a reasonable cost-benefit ratio. Right? Um, right. Uh, we also integrated SMR with a C dialect called SIL. So this table shows some matches that were actually not written for a ton. They, they, they were written in C. Uh, to the left, we have the patterns. And on the top, we have several C benchmarks that were used as inputs. For instance, here, the, a single precision, precision gem was matched four times in the darknet benchmark. Each one of the numbers here indicate how many matches we found for each one of these uh, benchmarks. And the idea here is to show that SMR can actually work with multiple languages, right? Demonstrating its flexibility. Um, while we were able to uh, integrate SMR with Fortran using Fear, we were also able to integrate SMR with C using SIL. All uh, right, so, so the next step was to test uh, scalability. Uh, the first, first scalability aspect we wanted to test is how SMR would behave uh, if we just increased the input. So here we have the same C benchmarks that were used in the previous experiment. And we essentially, we get, we gradually matched those, uh, those benchmarks and measured how much time it would take to actually try to rewrite the entire benchmark. Right? Uh, and essentially here, what we have is the runtime by the input size. Uh, in this case, for instance, the FM, FFmpeg benchmark has up to 300,000 lines. And here is the percentage of that is the percentage of the this amount of lines that was matched given this runtime. So we see that is it is mostly a linear speed up, a, a linear increase in time, which is actually expected since we were linear increasing the number of lines matched. And to the right, we have a more detailed breakout of the darknet benchmark. And here we can see that, that a lot of time is actually spent on IO operations. These were mostly done in naive ways. So there's still a bit of room to improve this. And another interesting aspect of this graph that it demonstrates how much faster the CDG is actually when uh, actually is compared to the DDG. So while the CDG has to model the entire input code, uh, it takes a, just a fraction of time of the DDG stage, which only mo models the candidates, the candidates that were approved by the CDG stage. Uh, kind of reiterating the, the need for this two-stage uh, matching process. Okay. And the other aspect of scalability that we wanted to measure was regarding to patterns. So we also wanted to ensure that SMR would scale well when we have uh, thousands of gem patterns, right? For instance, and what we did here is we essentially generated several permutations of gem patterns and gradually added them to the path file while maintaining the input size fixed. And what we see here is a, a little to no variation in runtime. This is also one of the benefits of using automata, as I mentioned when talking about Twig. We are es essentially matching the input with against every pattern at the same time. So the actual increasing runtime when we add more patterns becomes uh, very small. And to the right, we actually have the, the time to serialize the, 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 the PFA file, right, the, the PET file. And the idea here is to demonstrate the overhead that we are actually eliminating by using the serialization process. So if we want to build the automata for a 6,000 patterns, for instance, that would take about 200 seconds. Uh, 
but you don't really need to to expand this overhead every time you want to run the match because you can just load the serialized path file which has all of that sort of ready to be to be used uh, and finally another experiment regarding par pattern scalability uh, we also measured the size of the automaton right uh, by adding different variations of the same pattern and seeing how the automaton would scale uh, according to these to, to these new variations. So the idea here is that we added uh, gem patterns to the to the same pad file and measured what was the size of the automaton for each amount of patterns. And we can see that the, the automaton eventually flatlines. Again, because one of the benefits of using the automaton uh, approach is the fact that we have the prefix uh, merging, right? So if two strings have the same prefix, they reuse the same path. Eventually, the same variations do not generate enough new states. So it, it flatlines here at about 1,000 states, even if we have thousands and thousands of gem variations. Um, and to finish the part of results, I wanted to discuss some of SMR limitations. So uh, SMR has some inherent limitations, right? Uh, mostly because using source code can be pretty complicated when describing patterns. Um, one, of these one of these limitations is regarding restrictions on patterns. So we established some restrictions on what code can be used with SMR. Not every MLR code is a valid pattern, essentially, mostly because modeling the DDG for certain MLR structures can be pretty difficult. Uh, for instance, um, operations must have a single result, otherwise modeling the DDG would end up being far more complex, right? It would have uh, far more used edges. And another example is that regions must have a single basic block, because if we have to also model the relation between the basic blocks, the DDG will also increase in complexity, uh, making it even more difficult to actually run the algorithm. Another limitation is the sensibility to front ends and dialects. Uh, using source code for rewrites specifications brings some disadvantages, right? Because the changes to the front end and the dialect these front end uses will ef eventually affect uh, SMR, right? The, the matches that it can actually perform. The wrapper functions, I, I think, are a good example of this. Uh, we need the wrapper function so that we can actually compile the source code. And um, well, another example is the fact that we ended up deprecating uh, the seal dialect, mostly because there was no community support for it, and there were a lot of uh, C code that was not compiling with that particular front end. So these are some examples of the limitations that using source code to describe the rewrites um, have, right? And the last limitation I want to talk about is the limited pattern generality. Uh, essentially, patterns don't generalize very well. Um, and here, mostly because the MLRS flexibility here kind of acts as a double-edged sword in this case, uh, it does allow us to easily adapt the algorithm to multiple front ends. And, but the, the high-level representation and the variability that we have between dialects can be pretty difficult to encode as a, as a graph. In our case, our, as the DDG that models the data flow of the programs. So to ensure correctness, we end up with a very strict DDG representation, right? which in turn causes small variations to prevent matches. Some examples of this would be, for instance, switching commutative operations. If we replace the order of some a sum, for instance, that can be enough to break the match because of the numbered used F chain edges in the DDG graph. Um, another, another example of this would be type-specific operations can get in the way of reusing the same match for different types. So if we have, for instance, a, a single precision gem pattern, we will likely not be able to use the same pattern description for a double precision gem pattern uh, or for a, a integer uh, multiplication for an integer gem pattern, for instance. And SMR can be improved to, to sort of make patterns generic, but the, the trade-off that we see there is essentially the more generic we want it to be, the more complex the DDG representation will be, uh, eventually kind of making the process of matching uh, far more difficult. All right. I think that wraps up the, the this limitation sections of the results. Uh, so that's all I had to say. Uh,
hopefully I was able to, to clarify our motivation for creating SMR and the goals we set out for it, while also giving an idea of how it works and the results we were able to achieve. Uh, for more information, you, you can look at the RFC or the paper, or also look at the repository with SMR's code. Um, and well, I think that's it. Thank you all for your time and feel free to ask any questions or give us some feedback. Well, thank you uh, very much for this presentation. That's a pretty extensive uh, amount of work. It's very well presented. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, ask in the chat and I can relay. Hi, yeah, uh, quite enjoyed the talk. Uh, I was sort of curious, um, have you looked at, at PDL as well? And how do you see these two systems potentially working together or being able to utilize some of the same aspects? I have looked at PDL. Um, we actually were looking into using PDL for this project at the beginning of it, but I haven't been up to date to PDL, so I might be uh, have some, I have I might have some outdated information. But the issue we had with it was essentially that it wasn't able to match regions uh, at the time that we started working on this. That doesn't mean that we we can really integrate both of these aspects. One of the ideas that we had, but I'm not really sure how feasible that would be would be to, instead of encode the, the patterns as an automata, for instance, try to create a translation layer that would be able to convert the MLR code of the pattern to a PDL pattern, for example. Um, but, but again, uh, this, is, this is also speculative. We, we are actually, we still need to look into that, how feasible that would be. But they could definitely complement each other. Each other. Yeah, no, I think that that's quite interesting because I, I think with, with PDL also the the intention was to to comp well I don't know if it says was or is uh, to to compile down to an automa uh, you know and so to compile it all down so I, I think from that point of view it, it does seem like it it's you know there there's some ability to um, be able to share there um, and and funny enough even when I, when I looked at sort of like the the before and after. That looks interesting for me, just from like plain MLR snippets. You know, I think there's a quite a few, you know, uh, common rewrite patterns um, that, in a way, this almost looks like example-based rewriting. Um, you know, so like I, I know it's presented here as as for like higher-level programming languages, but you know, this actually seems quite nice to me, even just like at the plain MLR rewrite level, where you have. Uh, let's say like a rough ops or whatnot or Tosa and, and you know like this before and after. Um, and I, I'm assuming that that is actually also relatively easy to support here. I mean, like the, the the that's almost less work, right? Because you're already starting in the MLR section. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure how easy it would be to convert the sorry the source code to to MLR. As I said, I, I I'm pretty outdated into the PDL. But that that definitely would be the path to merging these two ideas. This is where you could be able to use source code to describe the patterns, right? And we lower everything to MLIR, and then we find a way to convert that into a PDL pattern that can then be used to pattern matching. Okay. Um, perhaps just one more one more question uh, with respect to sort of like the, the placeholders for the rewrites. Um, I believe today those placeholders are all uh, in in the the function arguments, and they all have to be like valid code. Uh, or valid input language code. Um, have you thought about ways to, for example, ex express some, uh, you know, like polymorphic matching where you, you'd, you'd want to have the input, you know, like the match generated be agnostic to the input type, but in the source language, you, you have to specify the type? We have not. Uh, essentially, this sort of generalizations, we haven't really looked much into how we, we could actually do this. We do have some ideas of how to, to improve the, the generality, but I'm not sure if we'd be able to generalize enough to actually have sort of polyhedral matchings, for instance. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? There's a question in the chat, uh, but it's... <clears throat> Sorry, uh, but it's uh, similar to the one uh, that was just asked uh, right now. Okay, I don't see anything in the chat, but okay, that's great if it's already been answered. Uh, 
Well, if we don't have uh, any other question, uh, what's the future of this work and what's your, your plan for these finishes? What are you looking to do with it? Um, well, I think our final goal will be to integrate that with MLIR in some way. So as we're talking about here, I think PDL might be an interesting path for that. Um, and yeah, I think that that'll be essentially our, our final goal. And maybe of course, sort of improve SMR in some way. As I mentioned, there's still work that can be done regarding the generality of the patterns. Uh, and as well, we could create more integrations for different dialects. One thing that we have in mind that we think it is essential to work with the C language would be to integrate that either with the, the clean guy or there's being, is being currently developed or maybe with poly guys that might also have uh, some benefits to to matching C code. Okay. Anyone else with one last question? Otherwise, we're going to wrap it up. Okay, well, uh, so that's it for today. Um, thanks, uh, Vinicius, for the presentation. And thanks, everyone, for attending. And see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.